you know, the thing that always drives me is, is people. And I think video and filmmaking and, you know, documentary and, you know, all that kind of good storytelling. I think that is the best medium to be able to communicate with the world right now. So everybody watches movies, right? Like everybody watches video content all the time. That's our primary form of entertainment. And it's our primary form of ingesting information. So I think it's the most important medium. And um, I think, you know, if you're, if you're not doing anything with video and you're a business or something like that, you should be doing things with video. It is, it's the most important way to get your message out there right now. What is up, everybody? My name is Austin Heisler, and I am a van lifer, entrepreneur, and now podcaster because this is your creative roadmap episode one. I am so excited. We have so much great content to bring you guys. In this first episode, I am interviewing my friend Matthew Wagner, who is just releasing his full length documentary. When Hope Breaks Through, I hope this podcast encourages you, inspires you, and lets you know that no matter how hard the creative journey may be, how many, no matter how many grueling hours you may spend editing, creating content, or doing anything like that, the creative journey is possible. You just have to stick to it. My name is Matt Wagner, um, and... Uh... Actually, my, you know, if you if you follow my accounts and stuff, it's Matthew Wagner. That's my professional name, I guess. Um, but yeah, I got into videography uh, during COVID, actually. So not too long ago, about yeah, a little before COVID, I, I started having the itch. And then through COVID, you know, I was um, working at a, a church. I was leading music. And all of a sudden with COVID, my job became a lot more video driven because, you know, everything shut down and we had to figure out what to do. And so we just started, you know, producing video content, sitting down with people, telling people stories. And um, that's where I really started to love that. I loved just sitting down with people, setting up the cameras. I'm a technical, I love technical stuff. So setting up the cameras is fun. And then more importantly, sitting down with someone and just talking to them and hearing their story and doing an interview um, and then taking that and kind of crafting it to tell to the world, I just fell in love with it. And, um, and it's my favorite thing I've ever done in life so far. Uh, who knows, maybe I'll do something else in the future, but right now it's just been really cool to go from, okay, I love this thing through COVID. I started to develop it more. I kind of put in some reps at a uh, marketing company that I worked for for a while and just started really, you know, honing in the skill set that, that I needed to, to grow in this video field and started building clients. And, um, yeah, that's, that's what I do today. Obviously there's more to it than, than just what I said. It was, you know, a long, uh, process of a few years to, to get to where I'm doing this full time now as a job. Um, but I absolutely love it. And the thing I love the most is, um, you know, there's a, I think there's a lot of people that are in videography that they really love the, the gear they love getting like the creamy shots and everything looks so dope and you know all you know bouncy and 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 I think that there's um there's so much value in that and I I'm a sucker for some of that stuff too I really like it um but you know the thing that always drives me is is people and I think video and filmmaking and you know documentary and you know all that kind of good storytelling I think that is the best medium to be able to communicate with the world right now. So everybody watches movies, right? Like everybody watches video content all the time. That's our primary form of entertainment and it's our primary form of ingesting information. So I think it's the most important medium. And um, I think, you know, if you're, if you're not doing anything with video and you're a business or something like that, you should be doing things with video. It is, it's the most important way to get your message out there right now for good or for bad. And so that's why I think we need people that are, do that are doing it for good. COVID was definitely a time when forced people to like get creative and kind of jump yeah. out of their shell, you know, and just jump into things. It was definitely 
I feel like it was definitely the perfect time to take that leap of faith in whatever your passions are and whatever you wanted to do. Yeah. Like, well, the world might be ending, so might as well do it. COVID felt like it kind of, um, you know, I, I, it did the same thing in different ways for a lot of people, but I feel like whatever was kind of happening in people's hearts before COVID, COVID had a way of kind of blowing it up, right? And so for me, it was, I was kind of feeling like, ah, I want to, I'm not sure, maybe I'm not fully fulfilled. I want to do something different. I don't know. And then COVID happened and it was like, well, I might as well try it. You know, why not? There's nothing better to do. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think for a lot of people, it led to a lot of big changes in people's life. And for me, it led to a career change. So. I was going to say, I, I know that you're really into documentaries right now. And that's kind of what you uh, what you want to do. So I want to hear about, I know you said you got started in video, but what specifically inspired you to want to film documentaries? Yeah, um, man, the, I think there was probably a couple things happening at once that kind of got my got my attention. So, you know, in the sea of um, learning, you know, when you're you're kind of, exploring things and you're thinking, oh, I want to get into this new hobby. What's the first thing you do is you start going on YouTube. You know, most people do anyway. And it's like, hey, let me look and learn about this. Um, and so on YouTube, what I found was I started to just kind of um, learn a lot about the gear and the technical things. And there's so many channels out there that is technical and gear and the new cameras and, you know, check this out and all the features and all that stuff. And so I learned a lot that way. But uh, there were a few channels that I came across that were just very much more driven on um, the story. They're more driven on like, okay, you know, gear, you've got all this gear, that's fine. Gear is great. But what's more important is like you could shoot something on your iPhone and it could be way more impactful than somebody using an 8K cinema camera if you're a better storyteller than than the 8K guy, right? So I started to kind of, you know, I was doing the video thing. I really wanted to, I was working, you know, doing some things with that for the church that I was at. And, um, and then, yeah, when I started to discover just, just more of the concept of, um, elements of story and like storyboarding and creating story arcs and creating character development and different things like that. Some of these YouTube channels that were talking about that, I found myself really drawn towards that end of things. And, um, most of the people talking about that uh, seem to be documentary people. So um, I just, I don't know, you know, it kind of scratched like an an itch where it was like um, something, there's something about my personality that, um, you know, people, people that know me really well, they know that I love to go on adventures. I'm like very, uh, you know, I'm, I'm outdoorsy. I surf the Great Lakes, I'm, you know, cold water surfing, I'm, you know, going on hikes, I'm mountain biking, I'm doing stuff like that. And, um, and so I, there's something about me that like, I get kind of bored with the mundane rhythms of life. And I really, really like exploring and diving into new things. And so documentary, um, I guess like on a selfish level, uh, making documentaries is a way for me to kind of go into a new world, jump into someone's world and just explore it with them and kind of be a part of it. Even if I don't know anything about, about their world, like I can be a part of it. I can tell a good story and then, and then you go, okay, this was awesome. Now what's next? What's the next world that I can capture? Um, so for me, it's very much in line with my personality of being able to just jump into different topics that I find fascinating. You know, I love learning new things. I, I'm always just researching and learning and um, documentary is a way for me to explore and learn hands on. So that's kind of, you know, selfishly, uh, that's part of why I love it. But then also um, just, you know, on a practical level, getting into documentary, um, I, I didn't really anticipate it right away. Like, you know how you kind of make you say, oh, maybe I want to do this thing. And then you'll make kind of dreams in your head, but they're not really like concrete plans, if that makes sense. Um, that was kind of in my head. I was like documentary. Yeah, that's kind of a maybe one day, you know, maybe one day I'll be a 
Werner Herzog or, you know, some documentary. I, one day, yeah, when I'm 40 or whatever, or when I'm 50. And um, what happened was I had a, uh, I was just trying to kind of build, build a business, a video business, because I wanted to run a business. I wanted to kind of be able to manage my own schedule and, you know, work out our family rhythms better and stuff like that. So I was just trying to build a business, but one of my clients, um, they ended up uh, saying, hey, uh, you know, we loved what you did for us. We loved the work you did. We have this thing called, uh, that we do, and it was a farm. My client was like a cattle farm and they did like, you know, uh, equestrian training and they did camps in the summer and they did all kinds of stuff. So they were like, hey, we have this thing that we do that um, we do rodeos here, but we also do Mexican rodeos. And um, people don't really know what that is in the United States. And there's a bit of controversy around it. And so we were wondering if you would be able to film kind of an educational documentary about what this is for us. And so my first documentary was that, is they reached out and said, do you want to film this? We'll pay you a little bit. Um, And we just want a good resource to point people to when they're like, what in the world is Mexican rodeo? So I was like, great, awesome, you know, and so it just, it just kind of, um, it kind of dropped in my, into my lap. I never would have seen that world as something to where I would go, Ooh, I want to go make a documentary about this world. But they presented the idea and I was like, heck yeah, let's do it. So, um, that's, that was my first documentary. And, um, I think that really, that went from like a dream or an itch or kind of a bug that was planted in my brain to, oh shoot, I'm, I'm making a documentary now. And then it went, I'm way in over my head, you know? And then I felt very inadequate with (laughs) what I was doing. Um, and so I really just, you know, on that, on that project just had to learn a lot. And so I learned a lot about, um, you know, that was the first time I ever really kind of dove into color grading. And the first time I kind of realized mistakes that I made when I was shooting the footage and, um, you know, learning how to, because it was more of an educational documentary, learning how much research I had to put in to go on the back end, gathering like archival footage, gathering, um, I don't think we used any stock footage. Well, yeah, we did a little bit of stock footage. Yeah. So gathering stock footage, gathering archival, gathering information. Um, And what I learned was that uh, especially when you do an entire project, yourself, which both that one and my feature length doc, I've ended up doing mostly by myself. But, um, when you do a project like that by yourself, it is incredibly time consuming. It's a lot of work. And so that was kind of my learning process of like, okay, do I like this process? Do I like the long, you know, you go from, I'm going to make this quick bouncy promo video, or I'm going to do this little talking head. That's going to be a five minute interview. You go from that to like, where, you know, we just finished our feature length um, and it's an hour and a half long. And um, going from there to there is a huge leap. And you have to, you have to really um, like the process of being in something for a really long period of time. And just like, you have to take breaks, obviously, but being in that for a long period of time and living in that world, that's what documentary filmmaking really is to me. And, um, and I think that's why I love it. So I'm, I'm kind of wired for that, like jumping into somebody's world for a year or whatever, and then pulling out and then taking a break and relaxing and going, okay, now what's next? What's the next world I can jump into? Um, Yeah, sorry, that answered a lot more than what you asked, but that's kind of what that Mexican rodeo doc kind of fell into my lap. And that's kind of what put me into this documentary world. And I've just been learning and growing and figuring out film festivals and just just learning a ton ever since then. And that was probably three years ago. The Mexican rodeo, that kind of jumps into the next question that I was going to ask. So that kind of fell into your lap as um, a first project, a first documentary. So without knowing like how to shoot documentaries or getting yourself used to those long feature films where the process isn't just like a week, you know, when you can go in, shoot the whole Um, project in a day and spend about like eight hours editing it's obviously weeks upon months so when you first started this documentary you you made the jump from video content creator to documentarian 
Um, what was like one of the first challenges that you faced and how did you overcome that challenge? Yeah, man. Um, well, one thing I'll say, uh, just, just so people, uh, don't get too big of dreams <laughs> is, um, <laughs> uh, dreams are great. But, um, one thing that I'll say is, I don't know if you ever really make the jump from content creator to documentarian um, because one thing I'm learning in the world of documentary is um, you're always having to fund your projects. And so like there's not there's not a ton of money in documentary filmmaking. Um, now, we you can get get that we've on my feature length. We've had some funds coming in and stuff like that. But you're at least for me, I. I've always found myself like I still have to be a business. I still have to do content creation. I still have to make things that are like regular paying gigs for brands. And then the, a lot of, you know, my actual business funds, the initial documentary stuff, and then you can get reimbursed and stuff like that. But that, you know, it's not, um, yeah, I, I think in, when I first started out, I had in my head that, um, that you just, become a documentary filmmaker and then it's like Hollywood and then you, you just work on that and that's all you have to do. And uh, it's a lot more complicated of a process on the back end with distributors and streamers and like all that stuff is just keep your day job if you're going to make documentary films. <laughs> um, or if your day job is, you know, content creation or videography, like it goes well together and that's that's one of the things I love. But I would say my biggest um, challenge uh you know, on a, I'll say a couple things. Um, on an editing standpoint, like a technical standpoint, the biggest challenge for me, especially with that first documentary, was, you know, I got all this footage and filming was easy. I shot for the for that Mexican rodeo doc, which if anybody's listening, is called Charo and Steed, and you can watch it on YouTube. It's been on a it's it did a PBS run if you live in Minnesota, <laughs> but it's mainly on YouTube. That's probably be the easiest spot. Um, but yeah, uh, the thing that I found with that is I didn't shoot a ton. I, I shot pretty much the rodeo in one day, and then I did um, like an hour long interview with a guy, and that was it. That was all the footage I had. So um, from an editing perspective, I think I learned kind of the hard way and really quickly how much time goes into editing a story like that. So this, that particular doc, it was a short, so it was a 20 minute documentary. And, um, even just a 20 minute documentary, you know, I've made 15 minute or 20 minute YouTube videos before I've made, you know, maybe 12 minute talking heads before. And so you think, Oh, that's not that much more time. It's only, you know, 20 minutes. It's only six minutes longer or whatever. Um, but the reality is when, when you're going to classify something as a documentary and you, and you let's say you want to put it in film festivals and you want to get it out there, you want to maybe get distribution or something, um, you really, really have to focus on the editing process. And it takes so much longer than what you think. So that was two days of shooting for that documentary, but easily probably three months of editing, you know, and and that's because you 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 do something you think this is great you step away from it for a couple of days you come back and you go oh shoot no that doesn't make any sense you know and you have to keep looking at it with fresh eyes um and i didn't at the time i didn't have uh you know maybe the experience or the ed the technical editing skills that i do now so i was just kind of like learning a lot on the fly um, and I'm, I'm somebody who does that a lot. I jump into things and then I kind of figure it out as I go. I'm not like, uh, I, I do a lot of research, but I do research as I'm doing the thing. I'm not like, uh, do all the research first and then, and then figure it out. I really have to learn on the fly. And that was something I learned is just editing is really, uh, grueling. It's really hard for documentaries. Um, and being able to just trim everything down and tell everything in the, in the most impactful, but also the most concise way that you can is really important. Um, and, and just, yeah, yeah. So I would say editing that, that was probably the biggest learning curve. The other, um, the other things I started to learn with, uh, with that documentary is just the back end of things. So, 
you know, you're, you're making YouTube videos and stuff. It's really easy. You just edit the video and you upload it at whatever. YouTube will take MP4, MOV, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Throw it up at 1080, throw it up at 4K, who cares? Um, but with a documentary, you know, and you start, especially when you start getting into film festivals and you start having to send over things, like I had to send stuff to PBS and it, you, you have to get all these different file formats and you have to learn more about, you know, what codecs people need and what, you know, how, how you need to get the deliverables to people and um, marketing materials and, you know, like uh, a lot of people they'll ask for press kits and stills and like you got to have a film poster and you got to, you know, update it every time you get into a festival and put the laurels on the film poster and all that stuff. Uh, and it's a lot of um, kind of back-end administrative work. And so, you know, that's that's something they don't tell you about, right? Like you think, oh, I'm just going to do this fun, creative thing and I'm going to film everything and edit and it's going to be all art. And uh, And it is, it's a lot of art. But then there's also like, you have to be a good administrator in a way. You have to be organized. You've got to like, be on top of your email game when, when, you know, inquiries start coming in and, um, and you gotta, sometimes you gotta tell people no. And sometimes there's a lot of pressure that comes with my, my second film, the feature length ended up having a lot of pressure and different things like that. So yeah. Um, I think that first documentary really just opened me up to a world of going, Oh, okay. This isn't just like, I get to have fun and make videos anymore. This is a very long process that takes a lot of hard work and uh and I enjoy the process but it's definitely um it can be hard and it can be it can be grueling and you can get impatient a lot of the times yeah absolutely so it sounds like the editing is is tough and I can imagine when you're sitting in front of the screen you know it's so easy to stay inspired and creative when you're in it you're inside the story you're seeing things going around it your creative juices are just flowing, but I can imagine that's not the case when you're just in your office spending those long eight hour days, just editing the same clips over and over again. You know, if you're a video editor, you know what I'm talking about. You know, it gets rough some days, but how do you, how do you stick, how do you try to beat that creative burnout when you're on this creative high and you're in the middle of these stories and then you're spending weeks to months in the editing studio. Like, how do you stay inspired and how do you stay focused on the story and try not to lose it when you're compared to when you're on set shooting and then when you're spending those long days in the editing studio? Yeah, man. Um, you know, one of the things that I do that I've, well, that I've learned to do that makes editing a lot easier is, um, when I'm interviewing people now, when I do interviews, I do them um, more on the fly. I don't, I don't script out a ton of questions. Like I know what I'm going to ask them, but I don't give people questions ahead of time. And I don't, um, I don't, e I don't really give people a direction of where we're going. Um, because I want people just to talk to me. Right. So, uh, so it, it feels natural and it feels organic, but one of the things I do is while I'm interviewing a person and in, just on the filming side, I'm, uh, I'm taking notes of like key phrases that they're saying, you know, and I'll, I'll try to put like a rough timestamp, like, okay, we're about 25 minutes into this interview. He said this here. And so that gives me a bit of a good starting point. When you come into the edit, then you kind of, you know, right away, you're not just relying on your memory and, um, you, you know, right away, kind of where you want to start from. Um, but, you know, you can do all that stuff on the front end and it's still just going to be a lot of, you know, like when we did the feature length, it was, uh, gosh, let's see, we interviewed seven people and some of those interviews were upwards of three hours long, you know? So that's like, you know, 20 something, 30 something hours of footage that you're just, filtering through and you're trying to find all this and condense it down into, you know, an hour and a half long documentary. So that's where it gets, um, that condensation process, like taking or con not condensation, condensing process. Condensation is like, you know, water on the grass in the morning, right? <laughs> um, 
or like on the outside of your uh, of your drink, there's like bubbles. Yeah, uh, condensing the condensing process is the most tedious. And um, a couple of things, you know, uh, that I didn't have for the first, or actually a couple of things I didn't have for either of my first two documentaries that I do have now is, um, you know, in, if you're using Premiere or if you're using DaVinci Resolve, which I use DaVinci Resolve, they uh they have like ai transcripting now so you can like get your footage and you just hit transcribe audio and it'll just turn the whole interview into a transcript and then you can edit it like an essay which is really cool because you can just drag and drop paragraphs and put it into your timeline um i didn't have that before and that that is a time saver what that doesn't do is um it doesn't help you know where emotion is and it doesn't help you know like like if they start crying or different things like that. So you do have to watch your footage still, but uh, it can definitely streamline the process. Whereas before it's like, okay, I've got to watch all 30 hours of this footage and I have to go through. Um, and my process with that is I'll, I'll go through and color code everything first. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll go, you know, uh, I'll, I'll chop everything up and I'll go and I'll take out all the dead space first, right? But I'll go orange. This is where they introduce themselves. Yellow, I'll write on a notebook. Like I'm a physical, I have an analog notebook. I write it in, it helps me. So I'll go green. This is where they talk about this topic, you know, whatever. And then I have all these pieces of paper. Like let's say they're for my feature doc, there was seven, seven people I interviewed, I think. And so I had basically like seven pieces of paper that were just like all the colors everywhere with all the topics. And then I put all the, I lay all the, it looks like a crazy person, you know, at my desk because I lay them all out of my desk and it's like all these, you know, I have bad handwriting. So it looks like there's like a serial killer uh, desk or something, you know, there's just stuff everywhere. Um, but that helps me to go, okay. I start to like pull the things in visually and build kind of a rough edit of everything I could use. And then I kind of whittle, whittle my way down from there. And it gives me, um, it gives me a lot of like bounce back where I can go, oh, this footage right here, this is really good. And this will line up really well for when they're talking about this. So then I look at my paper and I see what color they're talking about that. And then I just go to my other timeline and, and find that color. So the color coding thing is huge. Um, and then, you know, when I guess just like, when you feel like you're losing your creative rut or like you, you're losing your creative streak, um, which it happens a lot. Um, typically I'm editing a lot at night. I stay up really night or really late when I work. And, uh, cause I have, you know, kids and you know, my wife works and there's just a lot going on during the day. So I stay up late at night and, um, I'm somebody who gets like really, really hyper focused when I'm inspired and I'm in the mood. So I'll stay up all night and make a ton of headway, you know, um, which is cool. But then when I'm stuck, I'm stuck. Like I'm completely stuck. And uh, the thing that helps me the most is either working on a completely different project because there's always content creation I'm working on um, or just like completely getting away for a couple days um what happens is you get uh you get like blinded and you get biased to what you're you're editing especially when it's a real long-term thing uh, or a, like a very long like feature length or something you get really really locked into that moment and you get blinded to the rest of the big story and so if you can just stop when you feel like you're locked in and you're just too biased just stop take a take a couple days and then come back and then just watch what you've done so far from the very beginning and that typically helps me go oh okay this is where we need to go now i know what's next you know um it doesn't always work you know sometimes you have to force it or sometimes you like um i know during the process of um of the paddleboarding documentary we were doing this past year during that process, I would send people scenes, you know, I would say, Hey, I finished this scene. What is, what, what does this feel like to you? How's the pacing? Um, does it feel clear? Does it feel like, you know, what's going on, even though you don't know the whole story, can you jump into this scene and know what's going on? 
and getting that feedback from people that I trust, uh, that's, that's really helpful too, because if, especially if it's positive feedback, then you're like, oh, cool. Yeah. Now I'm excited again. And then you kind of get more of a, more of a creative spark. Or even if it's negative feedback, then you're like, oh, frick, you know, I gotta, I gotta really jump in. You're right, man. I gotta fix all this. Then you get another version of creativity, which is to fix everything, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I think that's important. Getting feedback, stepping away, um, you know, making sure that you're not, I mean, it sounds stupid, but I remember, you know, I pulled an all-nighter one time and I just ate like crap throughout the whole night. And I was just eating, you know, whatever, chips and peanuts and all kinds of nasty, just whatever, you know, I could find. I was just, yeah. And, um, and I just felt horrible, you know, the, the next day it was like, I just ate all this nasty garbage and I feel like, you know, so I couldn't even, I couldn't do anything the next day. I, w- I had no creativity because my stomach hurt. So just like, <laughs> you know, take, taking care of yourself and having a good rhythm with it is, is key to, um, get locked in when you get really locked in to where you're blinded, it can be really unhealthy, not just for your project, but also for you. So, uh, yeah. And then feedback from people that are, that you want feedback from, that's really important too. Cause like I can send any film to my dad and he's going to think that it's the greatest thing in the world. You know, he's going to be like, this is awesome. I've never seen anything better in my life. You're Steven Spielberg, you know? Um, but I don't need that feedback necessarily. I mean, I'll still send it to my dad cause it feels good, but I know that I want feedback from people that are in the industry that are going to be honest with me and tell me, you know, really, really what needs to change. That's really important as well. Two things that stuck out to me when you were saying all of that. The first thing I will say is, Matt, you make me feel better about the messy timeline. Any video editor knows about the messy timeline when you're in the middle of a project. <laughs> It is not pretty, man. Until that very last shot is done, you have notes, your timeline's all messed up, video footage is everywhere. So hearing that it's not just me made me feel a little bit better. But um, the two main things that stuck out to me is just, like you said, stepping away. And it's just so amazing, like how much more inspired you can. Like you think you need to engage your brain by like oh maybe i'll listen to music or do this but it's really like disengagement i feel like it really helps so many creatives is just turning off your brain stepping away getting away kind of resets everything and then the other thing that stood out to me is collaboration collaboration is so key just getting that feedback like i said from people you trust who is going to be honest with you but also tell you like what they think is going to be good is so important but um, oh that's man that's another thing too is like with collaboration is um if you get somebody in the room with you while you're editing that can help a ton because all of a sudden you go like there's an added layer of pressure where you're like oh shoot this person it's not just me anymore they're watching what i've done and um and so for me every time i've gotten somebody in the room like for the feature length I did, I had my second shooter come in and he helped me, you know, navigate some stuff. Cause as soon as he got in here, I'd show him what I have. And as soon as I'd get to a point where it's like, I wasn't sure about that edit, I would go, Oh shoot. You know what, dude, I know what we can do right here. You know, or, or he would have an idea or whatever. So yeah, man, Mm -hmm. that collaboration is key on a feedback level, but then also just like, uh, Man, I, I mean, for me, I create so much better if I'm excited about something and it's way easier to be excited about something if you got somebody there with you kind of cheering you on. What are your thoughts on um, Oliver Anthony who just recently exploded? Have you listened to him yet? I always talk about like art is subjective, you know, like any art that you could do is there's going to be somebody out there in the world that thinks what you're doing is cool and that will connect with other people. So, um, if you just stay true to that, you know, you will make connections and you will find your audience. You just gotta stay true to what you're doing and, um, you'll find it because anything can be cool. You know, anybody could be an artist if they want to, you just have to find out what that is in your, inside yourself. There's a band from like the eighties and nineties called Sonic Youth. And, uh, they were weird, dude. They're like the weirdest band ever. 
and like you listen to their music and you're like, what am I hearing? I have no idea, you know, because it was so off the wall. Tons of people hated it. You know, they're just like, what is this? We don't even know how to categorize this. Um, but they have a massive cult following because it's resonated with people and it's because they never, they never did anything that they thought people wanted. They just did what they wanted to create. And I, I think that is the ticket, man. Like if, if you're putting out what feels right to you and feels good, like, and you keep doing that consistently over a long period of time, there's going to be enough people out there that are resonating with what you're doing. You just have to play the long game and not the, not the quick, you know, sign the record deal or the, you know, the quick version of success. Cause I, I think that is when you, that's when you sell out a little bit or you, you kind of co make compromises that maybe you regret later on down the line. Going back to the documentaries, what is your, what is your favorite documentary currently? What that maybe you just saw or do you have an all-time favorite documentary? Ooh, um, in recent years, I would say some, some top contenders for me. One of them would be My Octopus Teacher uh, on Netflix. Um, incredibly well done. Sometimes Netflix, you know, when you, sometimes you hear, oh, it's a Netflix doc, it's going to have a certain vibe or whatever, but not, not this one. It's like really, it's, it's, it's very artistic. It's very cinematic. Everything is just, uh, the story is incredible the way they tell the story. So my octopus teacher, um, a big one that, uh, that really, really shaped me and made me think of documentary differently is, uh, Grizzly Man. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that one, but it's a, uh, it's a Werner Herzog documentary from like, man, it was probably like early 2000s. It's, it's not super new. Um, and the, the quality of, you know, most of the documentary is this guy who lived in the summer with grizzly bears in Alaska. And he got to know these grizzly bears and stuff. And, um, I mean, it's not, it's not a spoiler or anything, but the guy ends up dying like he ends up getting mauled by a grizzly bear but um most of the documentary is just like the footage isn't anything to shake a stick at it's just he had some kind of camcorder out there you know and it's just him kind of hanging out with bears and um so the foot it's not like this cinematic footage it's not like this thing um it's not a spectacle but what i learned from that doc was just like the way that the director chose to tell certain elements of the story was really, really impactful to me. It was really creative the way he chose to show that the guy died or the way that, you know, just creative decisions in that film were, were on point. Um, and so that kind of opened up something for me that's like, oh, I see. Story, the story of something is way more important than how good something looks or you know the the bells and whistles um so that that's been a, a key one for me um and then uh man i'm trying to think if there's any well i mean in terms of like you know i've kind of landed in this spot where i'm i'm doing a lot of like great lakes based stuff outdoor kind of stuff um which is really cool i love doing that stuff and um obviously you know one of the big films that got me inspired for that world is free solo, which everybody, everybody talks about free solo. You know, it's, it's just a really well-known documentary, but it's so well done. I mean, Jimmy Chin is one of my favorite filmmakers out there and, um, it's just really, really well done. And they played the long game. Like they told the long story. They didn't just tell the story of like, Oh, okay, here you go. Now he's going to climb this thing. It's like, no, you, you got inside the mind of Alex Honnold when he's, when he's prepping and when he's struggling in his head, when he's talking with his girlfriend, like just, you really got to know him as a person. And so, yeah, those are the ones that stand out for me. The it are all the, I guess all three of those that I just said are films that you get to know the individual on a really, really deep kind of one-on-one -on -one character study level, if that makes sense. Definitely. I'll have to definitely check those other ones out and, um, I just like to say, we'll have to, we'll have to get together after this and um, I'll grab all the, the links to your stuff, to your reggae album, you know, and we'll, we'll link to all these, we'll link to all these documentaries uh, where you can watch them and uh, even to your stuff too and get you plugged in. But um, let's jump into the, 
your full length doc, which is launching very, very soon. So give us a little bit of insight about that and what you're working on right now currently. Yeah, so uh, it's premiering in Toronto uh, this Friday. So I guess it'll it'll be premiering in the past once this uh, podcast comes out. <laughs> but um, yeah, so this Friday in Toronto, uh, September 15th is our Canadian premiere. And then the American premiere will be the very next day which is in in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan at a film festival out there. Um, and then uh, it's going to, we have two, two streaming service deals that we've got with it now. And those are, we might get some more of those. We have a distributor and stuff now. But the, um, yeah, the documentary is, uh, it's an hour and a half, so feature length long documentary about this guy named Mike Shorman. And he is, uh, He's from Toronto, Canada, and he paddleboarded across all five Great Lakes to raise money for mental health awareness for the mental health crisis in Canada, among, specifically among like teenagers and young people. And um, he has an interesting story because he, he was a paddleboard coach and he had a business where he rented paddleboards on the waterfront in Toronto and, um, or in near Toronto. I say Toronto, but it's like saying, you know, Detroit or whatever. It's that area. Um, so anyway, he, he was running a business and then he ended up getting, um, a really rare condition that's caused when your when chicken pox reactivates as an adult, um, which normally that would be shingles, but when it, when it gets in your ear, so when it, the, the actual infection goes into your ear, um, it causes brain damage and it causes neurological damage and, and it's called Ramsey Hunt syndrome. So he was running his business. He got hit with this Ramsey Hunt syndrome thing. He got misdiagnosed. They caught it too late. And so he suffered a lot of damage from that to where now he's, he's technically um, classified as a disabled individual because he, he lost um, feeling and movement. So he went completely paralyzed on one side of his body. He lost a lot of vision. He lost a lot of hearing. Um, he got some speech issues um, through that. And he was hospitalized, you know, and um, he had, com he lived in like a com complete, like perpetual state of vertigo. And um, so he would just like throw up all the time because he was so dizzy. He couldn't walk, you know, and, and it was just a whole thing. And um, he ended up, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing because he ended up making a, a really strong recovery from that. The doctors told him he probably would never walk again. And he ended up not only learning how to walk again and regaining speech and, and regaining balance, um, but he ended up being able to regain that enough to where he learned how to paddleboard again and he paddleboarded across all five Great Lakes. So it's a really, um, really, really inspiring story. And, um, you know, obviously he did all that with a, with a good cause and, uh, and, and that's to Ray, he raised a bunch of money for, for, uh, mental health programs in Canada. So, uh, yeah, I got connected with him, um, oh, I, a year and a half ago in the spring. So probably like March of 2022. And, um, it's, it's interesting because you know, a lot of documentaries are not, they're not paid projects, you know, nobody's out there going, or not a lot of people are out there going, hey, can you, can I pay you to make this documentary? A lot of them are kind of initiated by the filmmakers or whatever. In this case, um, Mike, the subject of the film, he reached out and just said, hey, I'm going to be doing this thing. I'm going to cross all the lakes. Um, how much would it cost for you to film and make a whole documentary about it. So for, so this one ended up being a contract. And then, um, and then through that, you know, one thing I learned is, uh, I didn't charge nearly enough <laughs> because, uh, it is, it's been a year and a half of my life that I've been working on this thing and, um, and it, and we're going into film festival season. So it's probably going to be another year at least of festivals and all that. So it's just a, you know, it's a lot of work, but, um, the story itself was incredible. The adventure was incredible. You know, throughout 
the summer last year, I, we would get these weather windows where, where it was like, hey, the Great Lakes are cooperating from this day to this day. Lake Huron is going to be flat. There's going to be no waves or whatever, whatever lake we were on. And, um, and so I would drop everything and go hop on a boat with a bunch of strangers and um, help film this guy crossing the Great Lakes. And, you know, one of the things that I, uh, that I had to get really creative with and just on the, the filming side of things and the filming process was uh, just a guy paddle boarding in empty water is not that interesting, you know, um, to film. Like, it's not an interesting shot to just have a guy paddle boarding in empty water all the time. So I had to get very creative with how I wanted to do the shots, um, which meant a lot of times uh, it, for that particular documentary, I ended up using a lot of drone footage um, just because I was locked in on the boat. I can shoot towards the water or I can get parts of the boat in there, but that's all I could really do on the boat. So then it was, all right, let's get the drone up. Let's get the drone from down low. Let's get the drone from up high. Let's get the drone from straight down. Let's get the drone from behind the boat coming over. Like just everything you could try to come up creatively with a drone. I think we tried every single type of shot on, on, during that process. And then just getting creative from the boat, you know, it really pushed my, um, pushed my bounds, boundaries of, of like creativity in terms of framing shots and just thinking about every single possible thing you could do with a scenario. It forced me to think. And I, and I like that about the project. And then, um, you know, the, the project is focused a bit on mental health in Canada and their, you know, the crisis that they're having with mental health in there. So, um, that part, like editing that forced me to do a lot of research. We interviewed some experts and that was kind of like a medical scientific piece to the whole film that, um, you know, there's always stuff you don't think about. And that was something I didn't really think about. I was thinking I'm going to go hop on a boat and it's going to be outdoorsy and epic and we're going to have this awesome adventure. And it was, it was an awesome adventure. It was incredible. But then, you know, learning kind of the, the medical side of things, it kind of taught me, it taught me how to kind of balance those interviews in there and, you know, how to, how to, um, how to create pacing in the film where you go back and forth between, or you got this epic adventure, but then you got to talk about like the mental health crisis. And then, you know, you got to talk about Mike's mental health struggle and you got to talk about, so yeah, it just, I think it, um, I learned so much on the project and uh, currently we're, we're at the phase where uh, we've been in, we've been selected for 20 film festivals now, which is cool. And then um, I think we've gotten, I want to say six, maybe seven awards, you know, out of those 20. Um, so we got best documentary, we got best editing at, at another one. We got, um, we got best soundtrack at one of them. That was cool because we hired a composer to do the soundtrack for the film. And uh, so that's basically his award, which is awesome, you know. So he's out there, you know, proud of that. And um, yeah, so it's, it's been doing the festivals. And then uh, that's the other thing that, that I've learned throughout the process is, um, you know, just number one, festival submissions cost money. We've probably spent two thousand dollars just in festival submissions and um and then getting connected to the right people in the industry uh is is a big deal because um you know we we were able to get connected with um some producers in canada who connected us to a distributor um so we we got connected with a distributor called canna media which is like they're they're kind of an umbrella company, but they're the largest um, film distributor in North America, which is really cool. And they basically work as a sales agent on our behalf to streaming services and, you know, different things like that, like media outlets and stuff. So they, um, they've gotten us, they've been able to secure two different streaming platform deals, which is awesome. So um, one of them is a uh, streaming platform called SurvivorNet, which is like a health and wellness channel. 
And then another one is, um, it's a streaming platform called Real Stories, and it's a documentary platform. And, uh, and it's put out by like, so Real Stories, um, they're, they're a very big, it's, a, it's like a subsidiary of this larger company called Real.Studios. And, um, and that, that company does a lot. So like that company, they were the, they were the distributor for Tiger King, you know, and they were, they, they kind of distribute for stuff that ends up getting on Netflix. And so, and, and things like that. So that's, that's kind of the, the wave that we're riding right now with the film is, um, is that, which is we're running, we're going to festivals, we're doing Q and A's as much as we can at festivals. And then, um, apart from the festivals, we're just, we're trying to get streaming deals and, um, just kind of, yeah, basically the goal is, you know, there, you can have a lot of goals in these type of projects. You can have your goal be to make the most amount of money. And that's one way to look at it. Um, or you can have your goal be to just get the most amount of people watching the project. So that's our goal is just to get as many eyes as possible on the project. And because it's attached to a good cause. So we're trying to spread awareness for, uh, for people to kind of examine their mental health and be open and honest about those conversations. And the film is a platform to spread that awareness. So it's not, I'm not a money driven person. The film is not just trying to make a bunch of money. Rather, it's just trying to get as many eyes on it as possible. And through streaming and festivals and anything we can do, that's, that's the goal. At some, you know, minus YouTube, we're not trying to throw it, just throw it out on YouTube yet, but, um, you know, we want to kind of do the festival and streaming run for a while. And, and, you know, uh, you know, uh, just PSA public service announcement. Um, there's not a lot of money in, in small streaming deals. You know, they, they pretty much cut you a check and they're like, here you go. And you're like, all right, cool. And then I got a, the distributor takes a commission. And then um, a percentage of that goes to the subject of the film, which is the revenue sharing thing that we worked out. Percentage of it goes to me, but then the percentage of it goes to my, to uh, my one of the producers. A percentage of it is I'm going to give a kickback to the composer. You know, so it's you're splitting the pie a lot of different ways, and it's not that much to begin with. And so, you know, nobody's getting rich off of it. Rather, it's just we want people to hear the story. I am super pumped to be seeing it. I will definitely be um, watching it when it comes out, either on the uh, things like that, uh, the streaming platforms or uh, whichever way. But um, we will definitely plug those links in and uh, different ways to be able to watch the film when it comes out in the links uh, below. But um, so you you talked a lot about like film festivals and uh, things like that and marketing the film that's kind of the world you're in right now so like on a very like upper level like if somebody like wants to be like a filmmaker they want their film to be seen like what is some just upper level advice that you would give to somebody if they want their film to be seen by just people you, you kind of want to trickle up and out if that makes sense so um the first thing is uh you gotta, it, one of the things is it helps to have a team of people that help you with the film. So, um, you know, my first documentary I did, it was just me and it was like, cool, I'll share it on social media. And, you know, people, people watched it. I, that one ended up going on YouTube and YouTube, uh, people really like it on YouTube. It's done really well on there. Um, and that's just kind of like, you can't control that, you know, you put it out there and you hope for the best. Um, but with this one, with the feature length, um, having, having a team of people around you that help you with feedback, like, like I mentioned, we had the B shooter, we had a composer, we have a producer who handles a lot of administrative stuff. You got the subject of the film. Um, I had a motion graphics designer. So all those people obviously are super invested in the film and they all have their networks of friends and family and stuff like that too. So it starts with just like get the people around you that you know and love in your circles, just get them excited about it and um, talk about it, you know, and post about it on your, on your social platforms and 
don't overdo it. You know, don't like, if you post about it all the time, people are going to get get sick of you talking about it. But um, get your friends and your family watching the film before it comes out. Get them, get them to give you feedback and stuff because then that's just building excitement in your circles. Then when it comes out and you do start sharing about it and stuff like that, then everybody that's in your circle, they're going to be sharing it too. And then so organically on social media, that's how things happen the best. It's just organic shares. So that's, that's one big thing. Um, uh, you know, what, one of the things we did early, early on with like the first, with the rough cut of the film was we had a private screening that was just for my friends and family. It was just people that I invited. We rented out a, a theater, um, like a movie theater and, um, you know, gave them the film and just invited like 30 people to come see the film. And, um, and everybody just really, really, you know, that wasn't like, Hey, I want your feedback. It was just like, Hey, it's, it's basically done. Like, what do you guys think? And, it, and, and it was like, man, this is awesome. Everybody's, you know, we're so proud of you. They're saying stuff like that. And so, you know, just doing little things like that to where other people get excited about it is good. Um, the other thing that we, um, that we have learned, and I haven't handled much of this, but, um, you know, if the film is tied to some type of public event or if it's tied to like some type of cause, especially like, like the paddleboarding one is tied to mental health. Um, you can get like, you know, it, it's advantageous to have kind of a, a press kit for media and, and have like, stills from the film and like trailers and everything kind of in one package and what we've been able to do in Canada because this was a huge this was all like when Mike was crossing all the lakes um this was all over the news in Canada it was a really big story and so with this one we've been able to kind of reignite some of those media sources and say hey we have a premiere coming out this day in Toronto um, and actually Mike, the, the subject of the film, um, he started out before he owned a paddleboarding business and all that, he was in public relations. And so he was like a PR guy for media. And so, uh, so he's really good at that. So he, he's been reaching out to media, giving them statements and stuff like that. And, um, so he's got two news interviews on Thursday, the day before the premiere, you know? Um, and that's just honestly, man, like, you know, that my brain isn't wired that way to think about media and the news and stuff like that. But he, his brain is wired that way. And so he was go, he went, okay, I'll just send him a press release. I'll do this and that. And, um, and I'm like, dude, that's, that's great. That's awesome. You know? Um, so that's the other key piece I think is don't let it be just you that promotes the film. Um, you've got to have like people around you that are better at certain things than you like for me my promotion is like like i'm not like a i'm not like a social media guru right like my promotion is i'm gonna put clips on there i'm gonna put stills i'm gonna put stuff on social media and and for me it's like hey look at this art that i made i'm doing this thing you know here's the trailer here's whatever um but there are so many other people on the team that are way better at actually like putting out real, real word about, about the film, you know? Um, so just having those people, man, having somebody that maybe is interested in learning the media markets and trying to get stuff to the news and trying to get articles written about it. That's really important. Um, and knowing if that's you or knowing if it's not you, that's really important too. Like for me, I know that's not me. I'm an artist. I want to create the art. I want to, of course, I'm going to share about it. Of course, I'm going to talk about it on an organic level. But when it comes to like actually like official promotion through media or official like, you know, social media strategy or different things like that, I, I have to rely on other people and I have to trust that they're going to do a way better job than me. Collaboration is my favorite part of art and marketing. And it is honestly the most important thing especially um I'm, I'm i'll probably have another podcast on this but especially when you're talking about the difference between art and design when 
artistic things have like purpose because you could create something that you think is so dope but if the person you're trying to speak to or your audience doesn't get it or if they're not understanding it then what's the point of even making it and the way to test that is to have those people around you have that audience around you that you can bounce questions hey what does this speak to you because then you're creating art with a purpose, right? So, and the way just to test that out is just to have that col- have that collaboration just to make sure that you're telling the right story to make sure that you're on point, you know? Awesome, man. Well, Matt, thank you so much for your time, man. It's just been a pleasure getting to hang out and um, talk and catch up. And I'm so excited to see this film. And um, I feel like a great way to to end this podcast is to to roll the trailer, you know, get people pumped up for that. And um, with that being said, we will um, roll the trailer. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Sounds good. Paddleboarding is hard enough. Imagine trying to do it with a disability that affects your physical and mental balance. In 2018, I got very sick. So what happened was I developed Ramsey Hunt syndrome, which is a reactivation of the chickenpox virus. Vision, speech, hearing impairments, vertigo. The nerves in my face shattered. The doctor said that I would never paddleboard again. Here we are four years later, uh, becoming the first athlete with disabilities to cross all five Great Lakes. Uh, But you're doing this all for an important cause. I'm doing it to raise funds and awareness for youth mental health. You know, it affects all of us. Anxiety, stress, we all have it. It's one of the leading causes of death in young people. 28 hours and 44 miles across Lake Michigan. That's what Mike Shorman just did this week when he stepped foot on North Avenue Beach. The weather changed suddenly. It it was pushing me back. My body was done. It just became a mental game at that point. Breathe, breathe. Take your time. Breathe. There's always stuff that happens that you don't count on, and the water is cold, the water is dangerous. kind of give it like all I've got because it will change and I will deteriorate. You know, with these lake crossings, the weather has to be amazing for, has to be good for me for a crossing. But also, um, when the barometric pressure changes too much, I'm affected. I still have disabilities that, that will be with me for forever. My goal, is to put mental health programs in schools in every province and territory across the country. With physical health, there's a mental health component to any part of it, anything that we are going through. Um, There is anxiety and stress and depression and, and, and it's not touched on and it needs to be touched on. And I decided then, okay, I just need to be strong enough to be able to do five of these back to back. And we're gonna do all of them. You know, these these things are, are dangerous. These lakes are dangerous. They're high stakes physically and emotionally. And I will attempt to become the first person with disabilities to cross all five Great Lakes.